Well, hello. I haven't seen you since Troy. How you been doing? Been nicely. How are you? Oh, but you know, I, I I forgot your name. My name is Herb. Herb, yes. Okay, Herb. Good to see you again, Herb. Again. Yeah. There's some other familiar faces in here. Oh yes, yeah, suffragette, suffragette. How you doing? Wonderful. I'm so glad to see you. All right. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Happy to see you too. That's good. All right. Yeah, a lot of familiar faces here. know why I'm here. I'm here to speak on my life. Now I have lived a long life and I have much to tell <laughs> but if I told it all we would be here clear to the next day and I don't think I would last that long nor you. <laughs> <laughs> 32 years ago, we all know what ended, the Civil War. I was there, Maryland, Virginia, South Carolina, Florida. I was there, and now my government does not recognize my service in the Civil War. I am invisible to them. Y'all know Queen Victoria. Well, she heard of my service and she a medallion a celebration to her Diamond Jubilee celebration. <laughs> now what does that say? What does that say? Well, uh, right before the war, I arrived in Boston uh, as a guest of the New England Anti-Slavery Society. Now, that had to be about May 1860. And while I was there, a special session of the uh, women's suffragette was going on. And I gave a speech, gave a speech, right on the same platform with my friends, Wendell Phillips and William Lloyd Garrison. Now, they compelled me to use not my real name, Harriet Tubman, but to use the name Harriet Garrison. You know why they did that? Well, I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. It was right after John Brown's raid. And there were slave catchers all around up in, up in Boston. So they feared for my life. They feared for my life. And I'm there. And it was at the same time that South Carolina seceded from the Union. Now I was there to raise funds for my next run. And I had to rescue a woman and her three children from Dorchester County, Maryland. Now, the woman, she carried the small old baby in a, in a body sling. And the other two children, well, they cling to her skirt walking behind. And several men came along to help. 
and they brought with them, excuse me a second, you know, traveling dust gets all up in my throat, just, just gets all up in my throat. <clears throat> mm, you have some sweet water here, that's pretty good, pretty good. Now, where was I? Oh, they brought with them an old uh, comforter and blanket. They had um, some kindling and pieces of bread all in a basket. And they brought some laudamen to keep that baby from crying. And we walked all night, walked all night. Then I, I laid that comforter out on the frozen ground in some thin, thick uh, thickets. And I went out foraging. Now, I didn't come back at the time I told them I was coming back. I was kind of late. So they feared that I was being followed. So they crept further into the bush. Don't worry. I found them. I found them. I whistled. And they heard me and they all came out. Now, I can't whistle for you now. <laughs> I done lost that whistling ability. <laughs> but they all came out. <clears throat> and I got those folks all the way to St. Catherine, Ontario, after crossing the suspension bridge over the falls. Hmm. Ten years. Ten years. <clears throat> I brought people to freedom. I didn't want to stop. But I agreed to stop. I even brought my family to Canada. I must have made about 13, maybe 15 trips bringing people to freedom. Now, that's where I stay up there. Not until Mr. Lincoln became president and the rebels fired on Fort Sumter, did I come back across into these United States. And I brought my family with me. And we settled in Auburn, New York. Pretty good, pretty good life there. Helping people, helping my family. Mom and Papa pretty old by then. But I took care of them. And then, my friend, uh, Garrett Smith, some of you know Garrett Smith, right? Well, he asked me to come back to Boston. Well, I, I agreed I'd come back, but I had to make a stop first in Troy, New York, to visit a relative of mine. <laughs> and when I got to Troy, all my abolitionist friends were in an uproar. Well, you know how you get sometimes. Some of you sitting out there, you know how you get. You see, there was a runaway slave by the name of Charles Nolly, and he was being held at the U.S. Commissioner's office. And they wouldn't allow any of the abolitionists in there. So they were pretty upset, pretty upset. Well, I made a plan. <laughs> and I wrapped myself in a great big old shawl. And I walked right into that commissioner's office carrying a food basket. <laughs> and those deputies thought I was a scrub woman. <laughs> thought I was a scrub woman. And when word came that they were going to send Nolly back to his owner. Ooh, Lord, Nolly went a little bit crazy. He scrambled out onto the window ledge, but before he could jump, the deputies pulled him back in. And then little old me, I went into action. 
I snatched off my shawl. I grabbed one of those deputies. Then another took him down, and I put my arm around Nolly. And I was taking him out of there. Now, this was no easy feat. This was no easy feat. You see, time and time again, hit over the head with policemen's clubs. But I called to my friends, drag us out of here, drag us out of here. I got outside. Another officer jumped me. I pushed him down, then another, and I grabbed him by his throat, throttled him, and threw him over my shoulder. And I never let go of the man, never let go of the man. And when the friends got us down there to the river, Nolly, still in chains, streaming with blood, and I threw him off into the skip and it took on off. Now, they had to be about 300, 400 abolitionists. We all got on a ferry to meet Nolly on the other side of the river. Now, when, when Nolly landed, he was seized again. <coughs> when we landed, now, you have to understand, we were a mixed group of men and women. And they had taken Nolly to the judge's office. So we stormed that office. And the first man up those stairs was a great big old huge Negro. And he forced open that door. And a hatchet swung by a deputy took him down and his body laid there blocking the door they couldn't they couldn't close it a number a number of colored women we rushed up those stairs forced open that door grabbed Nolly and I took him out of there on my shoulders down those stairs. And the first wagon that pulled up, I tumbled him in. And that wagon driver, he took off like a skull bobcat to Schenectady. <laughs> and let me tell you, let me tell you, Nolly was reunited with his wife and children and his children did not have to suffer under the cruel lash of a mistress unlike my childhood unlike mine my childhood was different from most of you I grew up like a neglected weed, ignorant of liberty, having no experience of it. At five years old, my childhood ended, for I was rented out to a woman to work in her home. I had chosen chores and taking care of the baby too. I had to sit on the floor in order to feed the baby. And when my chores were done during the day, it wasn't over come night. You see, I had to rock the cradle steady to keep that baby from disturbing the master and the mistress. And when that baby wailed, that woman, she come out. She reached up over the fireplace, bring down a, a, a leather whip, and she struck me across the face and neck. And it burned deep. 
blurring my eyes and the sear and hurt would not let go would not let go <laughs> she whipped me one time five times before breakfast all the while mama and papa begging the master to, to come and get me but when she could not use me anymore she sent me back and mama mama nursed me back to hell only to be sent out again to be sent out again mm -hmm. well you know some of those plantation owners said that <laughs> we uh, have a good life <laughs> that we safe as slaves <laughs> That's what, they, that's what they said. We had a good life. You know uh, Mrs. Stowe? Mrs. Uh, Beecher Stowe? Well, her book, I had someone read it to me. Because you know I, I can't read, but they read the book to me. And I hear that Uncle Tom's Cabin they made into a play. Made into a play. Now, I lived in slavery. So I'm not going to see no stage play about slavery. It's not real, not the truly real thing, because I lived it, I lived it. Well, I done got off, I done got off, uh, off the road a bit, didn't I? I was talking about the Civil War. <laughs> that happened sometimes. <laughs> that happened. Well, when the war, I got to sit just for a second. Ah, uh, now when the war, began. I didn't support Mr. Lincoln. <laughs> I didn't support Mr. Lincoln. There was only one decision to make. Emancipation. Total and complete emancipation. Mm -hmm. Now, I was thinking, I was thinking, that the North could send the flower of the young men down south to fight in the summertime and probably die of the fever, or they could send them in the wintertime and die of the ague. They could send them one year, two years, three years. They could keep on sending them until they get tired of sending them or until they use them all up. Still no good. No good. Cause I believe God would not allow the North to beat the South until they did the right thing. Now, Mr. Lincoln, he a great man. He a great man. And I'm a poor Negro woman. Well, at that time I was poor and I'm still poor, but a poor Negro woman. But this is what I wanted to tell Mr. Lincoln. How he can win the war, save some money, and save those poor boys' lives. This is what I want to tell him. Suppose there's a great big old snake down there on the floor. And he bite you. And folks are all afraid you're going to die from that bite. So they send for the doctor to come and cut out that bite. And the doctor comes and he's cutting out the bite, but the snake, 
he is still coiled up there and he bite you again. Now the doctor, he cutting out that bite. And the snake, he spring up and he bite you again. And the doctor cutting that bite out. And the snake, he keep on biting you until you do what? Kill that snake. That's right, till you kill that snake. Now that's what Mr. Lincoln needed to know. But <laughs> I didn't get to tell it to his face. <laughs> didn't get to tell it. So I threw myself into the fray of things to, to help win the war. And I started slogging along with General Benjamin Butler and his Massachusetts troops through Maryland. And I uh, did spying and scouting. Then I even followed the general to uh, Fortress Monroe in Virginia. Now, you know what? That Fortress Monroe was like a magnet for runaway slaves. They came in by the hundreds, by the hundreds. Hollering nothing on, in gunny sacks, no shoes, n n no beddings, nothing but hope. That's all they had was hope, just pouring in there by the hundreds. Now, General Butler, he was a smart man. Smart man. He realized that by using me to help train all of those runaway uh, men coming in there, that they were of value to the Union. Mm -hmm. Now he called them, all those runaway slaves that came in there, he called them contraband. Contraband, that's what he called them. And he had me train them as spies and scouts. Now outside Fortress Monroe, there were still thousands of slaves. And they were forced to fight for the Confederates. Oh yeah, oh yeah. John Parker. Some of you know John Parker. He fought at the, he was a runaway. He was a slave. He fought at the first battle of Bull Run, artillery for the Confederates. He wanted to switch. He wanted to switch. But he knew his owner would shoot him dead. He did get an opportunity in Alexandria. He got away. And he gave the Union forces all the information he could remember on those Confederates. And John Parker, he walked all the way from Alexandria, Virginia to Pennsylvania. Freedom. Freedom. Hmm. That reminds me. When I first walked to freedom, never to this day have I forgotten how I felt when I crossed that stone marker on the Pennsylvania line. I wept. I wept as I crossed. And I, I looked at my hand to see if I was the same person now that I was free. I had crossed the line into freedom. But there was no one there to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land. 
but I was no stranger to Governor John Andrew of Massachusetts. No stranger at all. Now, he asked me to uh, go to South Carolina with a group of uh, uh, white teachers, Quakers they were, to help those runaway slaves. I agreed to go and we left on a, a federal transport. Had to be about 1862, May. And when <laughs> I landed in South Carolina, oh Lord, the heat, the heat was so bitter, it made me weak. Have you ever been to South Carolina in the summertime? Huh? Huh? Who, who's you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about. All I could do was complain. I was complaining so hard I forgot why I was sent. <laughs> then I started looking around. And I see all of these contraband, all these runaway slaves. They were everywhere, everywhere. They were in the doorsteps. They were on barrels and in, uh, uh, in the roadway. They were lying. They were sitting. They were just everywhere, just, just like a, a swarm of bees. Swarm of bees. I thought and felt like I was in a foreign land. You know what? Well, I'm going to tell you. They spoke African. They spoke African. Now, their language was as different from ours in Maryland as you can think. As you can think. And these folks that I was sent there to help, they never heard of me, Moses. Mm -mm, they never heard of Moses. All they saw was a woman with skin as dark as their own, but whose words they could not understand. <laughs> and when I opened my mouth, they laughed at me. <laughs> at first, I couldn't understand them either. And on top of that, they were suspicious of me because I received army rations the same as the white teachers. So you know what I did. I stopped getting those rations. <laughs> and I got some of those contraband men. I paid them though. I got some of those contraband men. And I made, at night, when I got finished with all my, my spying and scouting, I made pies and gingerbread and root beer, and I had the contraband men go and sell it to the white soldiers. That's what I did. You see, by this time, <clears throat> the government had stopped paying me. They stopped paying me. But I still had to help, and that's what I did. So I started getting out among the, the folks and helping them. I helped the women to do the washing for the soldiers. Now, oh yeah, they know how to do washing, but for Yankee dollar, Yankee dollar. And I took up the protection of these women. You and I know what can happen in an army camp. No woman or girl is safe from the brutal lust of the soldiers. And that goes for the officers as well. You had to watch out for some of them too. 
So I took up their protection. And so I started to win their trust. And I was recruiting the men as scouts and spies. And I took them out on scouting expeditions. And we gathered intelligence on, on Confederate troop movements, the size of their army, and how well they were armed. And I had spies that even stayed back on the plantations sending in information. Now, there in the camp, there was a hospital. It was ran by a, uh, by a Dr. Um, Durant, Dr. Durant. <clears throat> now, Dr. Durant heard of my root skills, medicine skills. You see, more soldiers were dying from the flux than bullets. So he knew I could cure them, and I knew I could, but I needed to find the same plants and roots that, that grew in Maryland. I had to find those same plants there in South Carolina. So I went out in the marsh, and I searched, and I searched until I found water lilies and cranes bill. You know what Crane's Bill is? Say it. I heard it. Geranium. Geranium. Ooh, we got some root people in here. <laughs> Geranium. So I took the root of that water lily along with the leaves of the geranium. And I made a bitter taste in brew. And the first person I gave it to, Dr. Durant. <laughs> he was sick. <laughs> he was sick. And he got better. Oh, he got better. So then we gave it to another soldier, and he got better. Then I made up a great big batch of that bitter taste and brew and gave it to all those sick soldiers. Now, that, that's what I did, along with cleaning them up, sponging them down. Now, I would do this, I would, I get a great big chunk of ice, I put it in a pan, fill it with water, and I grab a sponge, and I go over to the first man. But before I could sponge him down, I had to Flash away the, the flies. And they would just rise up like, like bees around the high. And then I would start bathing him down. And by the time I got to the third or fourth man, the heat would have melted the ice made that water warm and it would be as clear as clear blood. I have to go and get more water and come back. And I would go to the next man. But those flies would be back on all the man, men I had just cleaned. Those poor, poor soldiers. Mm. Well, word spread about my remedies. And there was a group that came through there on their way to a Union outpost in a place called um, Amelia. Amelia Island, Florida. And they, they, they asked me to come along. Well, at first I, I didn't want to go because I hadn't seen my family in a long time. I wanted to return home, but I had to help these people at the same time. 
So I, I agreed to go. Army didn't pay me to go. I went because I wanted to go. And when I got there, I took care of those sick folks. But mostly I did scouting and spying. And all the information I gathered there in Florida, it was sent to uh, General Saxton. And he planned the raid. Based on my information, he planned the raid on Jacksonville, Florida. And Colonel Montgomery was the one that did that raid and, and took it over. So I'm still there in Florida, scouting, spying, doing a little bit of nursing. And word comes that General Hunter, he asked me to come back to South Carolina to lead a river raid. <laughs> now you know, and I know, that a general don't ask, right? What does he do? But he asked me, <laughs> he asked me, he asked me, he knew of my skills. And very boldly I said, the only way I would come back to South Carolina I would have to have Colonel James Montgomery at my side. I went back. I went back. I went back. Now this river raid was going to be on the on the Cumbe River. It was a long and narrow twisting river. And it was so narrow in places that the trees formed a, a green arch, blocking out much of the sky. And there were eagles, osprey, alligators, snakes, and mosquitoes so thick that when I wiped them off my hand, my other hand was covered black with them. And there were miles and miles of riverbank rice plantations. Now the government didn't give me any money, but you know what they gave me? Three gunboats <coughs> and 300 colored soldiers. Some from the uh, second South Carolina, some from the Third Rhode Island. Now it was, oh, June 1863. And we got up in the dead of night. And the fog was rising right above the, the rice fields. And I was standing on deck of the, the John Adams. And my pilot, Walter Plowden, he was maneuvering that gunboat around those mines. Now he was my best agent and former, he was a former slave. And standing right next to him, Colonel James Montgomery. <laughs> oh yeah. Colonel James Montgomery. Now we went down that river <clears throat> and at one point <clears throat> the colonel called out to his captains, told them to sound their whistles and the blast just echoed across the rice fields. When the slaves heard that sound, it startled them and they took to the woods. But then the boats started landing and calling and telling the folks that these, these were Lincoln's gunboats come to set 
set them free. And oh Lord, you should have seen it. You should have seen it. They started running out through the rice fields to the gunboats. There were women with children hanging from their dresses, hanging from their, their necks and their shoulders. They had chickens with their legs tied up. They had pigs on their backs and they were all running towards the gunboats. Oh, you should have seen it. You should have seen it. There was a woman that ran to the gumbo. She had two pigs, a white one and a black one. We took them all on board and we named that white pig Beauregard. And we named that black pig Jeff Davis. Oh, you should have seen it. You should have seen it. We took them all. We went on down that river. We damaged the sluice gates and flooded the rice fields. We burned buildings and what we didn't burn, we took. We destroyed nine plantations. We dropped off soldiers and picked up people. They couldn't be stopped. That second, that third Rhode Island, that artillery, where well, they took care of those Confederates. We did not lose a man. Not a man. And when we got to Buford, we had 700, 750 men, women, and children. And not a single Union soldier lost. Oh, I'm sorry. There was one casualty. There was a casualty. When I was out there helping those people to get on the boats, I got stuck in the mud. I was carrying two pigs. And I stepped on my dress, got stuck, and almost tore it off. And when I, I got on the boat, it was in shreds. And I made a promise to myself right then and there that I would never go on another expedition again wearing a skirt, and I didn't. Now that there was the only casualty of that combi raid, my skirt. And when I got back home, there was a package waiting for me. Sent from those suffragettes. You know what was in that package? Some bloomers. That's right. <laughs> Had some bloomers in there. Had some bloomers. Got all those folks there. Well, I was there. I was there. I fought. I spied. I scouted. Queen Victoria recognized my service. <clears throat> Yet my government does not. I am still fighting for what is rightfully mine. My pension and my back pay. It is 1897. What do you say? What do you say? I know some of my friends out there might have one or two questions to ask me. If you, you have one question you want to ask me. Yes. I did, you said that you never learned to read. No, I didn't. But could you write your name? No, 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 but I sure could could carry some logs and and drive some wagons and oh yeah and knew how to get through the woods. No, never, never did, never did. Mm -mm. Oh, thank you for coming. And um, you mentioned that you worked with General Butler. Yes, yes. So we in Exeter know General Butler very well. Right. He came to Phillips Exeter Academy when he was 11. Oh, smart man because he ended up being a lawyer.
graduated when he was That's right. That very smart man. Now he wasn't an abolitionist, but he knew what was right. Knew what was right. Does anyone um, have any questions for Gwendolyn? <laughs> yes. Um, your character and you have lived a good long time. Um, do you think the Civil War is over yet? War is never over. That's my personal opinion. As long as you have selfish, greedy people, war is never over. And then it's the innocents that get caught in the middle. Yeah. Thank, thank you for asking. What happened to Harry Tubman at the very end? What do you mean at the very end? Of her life. Oh, let me tell you, she was a humanitarian. This woman was a warrior humanitarian. Whatever she earned, she gave to help other people. She even had uh, started in uh, a home for the age, okay? Uh, bought some property, and then eventually she turned it over to the church in that area. But she always helped other people. She built schools. She had schools built. Okay, so she was always helping. So she died penniless, but she died happy because she served and she gave to other people. So that was her calling. She was a warrior humanitarian more than she was a warrior soldier, in my perspective. Yes? What were some of the uh, materials that you had to, uh, that you used to put together your Oh, well, first of all, I started out at the um, Harriet Tubman official website, and from there, they gave me information as to where some of their information came from. And there's two women who have a book out that is just absolutely fantastic. That's Clinton and Larson, and I think it's listed on my uh, Bibli that I have there. Those women, they, they dig out the information from a woman's perspective versus a male historian digging out information. That's why I love their books. So I got a lot of information from there. The Library of Congress and the, and the woman Branford, Mrs. Branford, who interviewed Harriet, twice and wrote about her as well. So I got that information from there. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. I have a question about Harriet, because she had some really wonderful medical skills using plants and right. And even though she was illiterate, was she able to pass that knowledge on to others? I have not ran across that, but, but reading other resources, women of her nature do pass that skill on. They will pick an apprentice and will pass that on. Um, that's what I want to believe, but I have not ran across anything. She adopt a, a young, uh, her niece, so she might have passed it on to her. But I don't know, I, I didn't see it in writing anywhere. But it makes sense, yeah, it makes sense. Where did she live out the later years of her life? Where is she buried? Uh, she's buried uh, in Auburn, uh, New York. She did have a military um, burial. So that's where she's buried. Yeah, she's there. I uh, saw another hand. Yes? Can you uh, give us a little snip as to her final recognition? Oh, her pension <coughs> and her back pay? Well, she never did get in her lifetime. The only pension she got was from her second husband, who was a soldier who died. And they did not want to give that to her because of the uh, Democrats who were in office at that time. Uh, they were the uh, former slave uh, owners and things like that. So they didn't want to give her any money because she had a, a price tag on her head. So a bunch of school children in the 80s, I believe it is. Did I bring it up here? No. In the 80s, a bunch of school children wrote a letter to a senator in Washington, D.C. They wanted to put up a plaque for Harriet uh, Tubman, and they needed some funding. So this particular uh, senator at the time, she dug into it, went into the records to see how much money it would have been if Harriet had received her back pension. And she went to Congress to try and get some of it. And she did get a little bit of it. It was like $11,000, I believe. And so she sent that to the school children. You know who that senator was? 
Hillary Clinton. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. Do you have a, a sense of what would be her top issue today to work on, or would she just be working where Ooh. she was needed? Now you, now, now you really, you, you want to wreck my brain, don't you? <laughs> I, that woman, she, she was, she was fearless. So um, I, I don't know where, what area she would have went in, but she would have tackled something. She would have tackled something. <laughs> so do we have any more time? Um, you know, I think we're pretty close to Okay. To you guys are great. <laughs> Thank you so much. In closing, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Gwendolyn. Since tutelage under attorney and professor Lloyd Barbie at the University of wisconsin Milwaukee has been a committed scholar of African American studies for women of color. Embracing her passion, Gwendolyn began historical performing in 1997 at the University of Texas Institute of Texan Cultures as an educational interpreter. Her program introduces an array of untapped accessible history that celebrates the rich diversity, ambitions, and heroism of African American women in the face of racism and violence. Gwendolyn is an artist with several organizations, one being the New Hampshire Humanities to Go, the National Women's History Project, Arts for Learning Connecticut, Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development, New England Foundation for the Arts, Boston Public Library System, and Learn Regional Educational Service Center of Connecticut. An award-winning artist in recognition of the quality and range of her work received the Theater and Museums, Theater and Interpretation Techniques Certification at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, a Reynolds Award for Valuable Service and Support at the Institute of Texan Cultures of San Antonio, Institute of Texan Cultures Director's Award for Excellence, recipient of ESA Connecticut Chapter portraying Sarah Harris at State Museum, Prudence Crandall, Certificate of Merit from the Office of Secretary of State of Connecticut, the Greater Hartford Arts Council and Boston Fund Individual Artist Fellowship, First Place International Toastmaster Award, <laughs> Connecticut Arts for Learning Signature Course Services Certificate, a mouthful, and Crown Miss Senior <laughs> Thank you so much. I am so grateful to the uh, Exeter Historical Society for having me back again. It's such a pleasure, a privilege to be here, and I thank you so much. Thanks.